Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this LSE online event. Um, my name is Alistair McGuire. I'm Professor of Health Economics here at the LSE in the Department of Health Policy. Uh, the head of department, Elias Mossialis, was meant to chair this meeting, but he's unable to make it today for uh, personal reasons. But I'm very pleased you're all here, and um, I want to introduce you now to the uh, panel of speakers who you can see. Um, if you're seeing them in the same order as me, underneath me, you see uh, Mikdad Azari, who's a assistant professorial fellow um, within the Department of Health Policy. He's a health economist, and he'll talk on um, social inequalities and how COVID has affected um, these um, social inequalities in a disproportionate manner amongst the BAME community. We then um, also have uh, Claire Wenham, who's next to him underneath me on the uh, right-hand side as you look at her. And uh, she's a, a assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy. And she'll be talking about um, perspectives and lessons learned from uh, previous historical uh, outbreaks and pandemics and also say something about gender issues. And right next to me on my right hand side is uh, Jose Luis Fernandez, who's Director of uh, Care Policy and Evaluation Centre at the LSE. And he'll be talking about how uh, the social care community and long term uh, care community has responded to the COVID um, pandemic. Um, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, for those on Twitters, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE COVID-19. And uh, as this is an online event, it will be recorded and you'll be able to pick it up in that hashtag as a podcast. Um, there's also, as usual, uh, a Q&A session at the end. So we'll have our four speakers will speak first. I'll go first as the first speaker. Then we'll have Claire and then we'll have Mick Dad, and we'll end with uh, Jose Luis. And then we'll have this Q&A uh, session. The Q&A button is uh, featured at the bottom of your screen. If you type in your um, Q&A, then I'll pick it up and direct that to the appropriate speaker. Um, and as I say, that will be right at the end of the, um, of the sessions. So, I'm going to go first and um, I'll share my screen now uh, and talk, uh, give you a background on uh, the economics of the coronavirus um, and say a little bit about this uh, trade off between lives and livelihoods. And uh, I'll give a couple of introductory slides. Um, you can follow up on the introductory slides through uh, looking at the website Our World in Data, which um, is a very extensive world uh, data site which um, has been covering the pandemic across the world. But I just want to um, uh, introduce a couple of background notes on this. On the y-axis here, we have the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases. And on the x-axis, the days since the 100th confirmed cases, we have uh, patched out a num all of the countries in the world on this website, but uh, I've highlighted a few. Uh, the United States, UK, Italy, Germany, and New Zealand. And as you can see, the confirmed state uh, cases are beginning to level off in a number of countries, not all countries, and I'll come back to that, uh, especially in Latin America, we're still seeing increases in confirmed cases. And of course, you have to recognize that the confirmed cases are less than the actual cases uh, due to the lack of testing. The death rates are uh, mapped here from the same website on uh, the y-axis with the days since the five, uh, five daily new deaths are first reported. And again, I've highlighted a number of countries. You can see, for example, that the US um, has peaked in terms of deaths and is becoming uh, coming down as are a number of the uh, European countries, including the UK, France, Italy, and Germany. Uh, Spain, uh, I, I've mapped out largely because um, that may give us some uh, uh, or may highlight some issues in terms of uh, recording deaths. Uh, Spain on a particular day recorded uh, zero deaths, but we think that's because 
it was at the weekend and recording was still uh, being picked up. But these are all the death rates from um, yesterday, in fact. Uh, as you can also see, uh, Brazil is maybe uh, uh, leveling off, but certainly India is uh, increasing quite uh, strongly in terms of the number of COVID deaths. So the take home message from both of these is that we're still uh, in the midst of this pandemic. It's by no means over. Uh, the US has recorded more deaths than occurred in the Vietnam, Afghan and Iraq wars put together. So it's had a major impact on the US in terms of deaths as it has in other countries. If uh, none of these death rates are uh, controlling for population size, if we control for population size, uh, this data is slightly older, as you can see, um, uh, I've put here the deaths per 100,000 population, so controlling for size, and uh, I've put in a large number of countries where death rates are still increasing. It's, it's a bit out of date um, because the UK hasn't quite peaked yet in this, uh, in this graph. But the main take home message I wanted to bring home to you from this is that the UK is doing particularly badly if we control for population size in terms of death rates. The US is the next uh, population control death uh, rate uh, from COVID, the number of cases on the Y axis here. Um, and in between the UK and the USA, we'd have a number of the uh, larger um, European countries. The UK's death rate's not only high, but uh, it's also important to state that as the UK reallocated healthcare to COVID-19, it's obviously impacted upon other healthcare. So from the period beginning April 2000, uh, 2020, rather, um, the cancer assessments within the UK National Health Ser Service are down some 60%. And the routine operations, elective operations, are down 85% when compared to um, the previous uh, year. Not only that, we've uh, experienced particular problems within the UK, as you probably know. Um, We've been a bit laggard, both in terms of uh, locking down, but also in terms of our uh, test and trace results. The first test and trace results came out about four days ago, the, on the 12th of June. And uh, those first results showed that uh, the um, NHS, Public Health England, uh, were unable to contact 33% of those who had tested positive. And in fact, of the 66% who they did contact who had tested positive, they then couldn't follow up with 15% of those contacts. Um, the tracing app itself was meant to be de developed as a UK app, um, but in fact, it was delayed somewhat in its introduction because um, the app had difficulties in measuring distant, distance effectively, which of course is a major problem if it's a test and trace app that you're trying to develop. So uh, up until yesterday, we've had in the UK uh, 41,200 COVID deaths. But in fact, again, if we think about the recording issues there, um, if we look at excess deaths, so excess deaths as related to the deaths that we've seen since the beginning of this pandemic and compare with the average of the last five years mortality rates, the UK has seen 64,200 excess deaths. As I said, there's been major problems, and I think one of the major problems that we've seen in the UK in particular has been a lack of integration between the health and social care sector, and uh, Jose Luis will possibly come back to that later on in his own talk. Um, so we're not over the infection rate, uh, infection yet, of course. Uh, I did mention test and trace, and that's obviously important to try to control the infection rate. And on this slide, I've got um, the uh, rate of infection in the population. And that rate of infection in the population is uh, defined by this parameter, which is a co contact rate amongst the susceptible population and how the susceptible population um, contacts into um, that uh, population with the infection. So we've got the contact rate, uh, which is uh, amongst the infected and the susceptible population, which is then 
we then net out the recovery rate, this parameter here, this gamma, in the infected population to get the rate, rate of change within uh, the overall population. And the reproduction number, this uh, R0 number, which everybody is, um, is focused on to try to um, uh, tell us how fast the infection is reproducing, is defined by the percentage of the contact rate over the infection rate. Um, we can also uh, look at the rate of change in the infected population by looking at the lockdown rate. We can add another parameter into this equation. So this lockdown rate is um, a power parameter. To, so it's a parameter in this case to the power two. And that's uh, a, a power uh, parameter to try to um, pick up or represent some of the exponential character of the infection as it drives out within the population. So the infection rate is then the contact rate multiplied by this lockdown rate in the susceptible population as it affects the infected population. And then we net out the uh, recovery rate in the infected population. And I think a number of things are important to say here. Uh, we have to note that, for example, the, um, the reproduction rate itself is calculated in different ways, uh, partly because of how time is modelled. So when we're modelling out the number of cases that are reproduced within a population, we're looking at things like the average duration of exposure, the average du duration of the latent infectious state, uh, asymptomatic state, the delay before infection and diagnosis, for example. And these will all affect the reproduction number in a way and therefore assumptions, because we don't know very much about this pandemic, the assumptions about all of the timing aspects associated with that uh, uh, reproduction number are quite important in terms of what we think the reproduction number is. Um, and it can vary quite markedly. In, in uh, Spain and Denmark, we think the reproduction number was as high as five in uh, the early phase of the pandemic and as high as three within the UK and the USA in the early phase of the pandemic. And now within the UK, we think it's below one, uh, but there are some regions within the UK where the reproduction number may still be creeping just above one uh, dependent on how it's modelled. The other thing to note is that the, um, the uh, contact rate and uh, the lockdown rates are, of course, something to do with uh, the economic and social dimensions of the population that we're trying to model. So the uh, contact rate obviously depends on population density, social integration, the age at which the infection rate really strikes, migration rates within the country, seasonality, for example, most of these are uh, social and economic uh, aspects. And similarly, the lockdown rate is uh, going to reflect how harsh or soft the lockdown is. And again, that's a, a kind of policy decision that governments have to make. Um, I mentioned we don't know very much about this pandemic because it is no new, of course. Uh, we don't know, for example, what the precise death rate is, and that's partly because testing hasn't been universal. And if testing hasn't been universal, we don't have the denominator uh, to allow us to calculate the death rate, the population at risk in the denominator. And of course, we might be picking up uh, death rates as they occur, but that's a bit like driving by looking in the mirror because the, the death rates are retrospective, they're historical, uh, and that goes for the excess death rate as much as anything else. We also don't really know what the counterfactual of the lockdown would have been. Um, we don't know what would have happened um, to the infection and reproduction, reproduction rates if um, we had not imposed lockdowns in a number of countries. Um, but of course, we're very interested, especially as economists, in the full economic of the impact of the pandemic in itself. And I want to now turn to look at this. And I'll do a couple of things in looking at the economic impact. I'll look at the short term impact in terms of the immediate costs and benefits associated with the lockdown. And here I want to look at 
uh, notions of how much we're, as a society, we're willing to pay for changing the probability of death. So that when the public sector uh, invests in any part of our life, so if it's building a new highway, for example, it, the public sector will undertake a, an investment appraisal. It will say, okay, we're, we have certain uh, construction costs for uh, the new highway, but what are the benefits? Well, generally highways have lower traffic accidents. And if there are lower traffic accidents, there are low, lower uh, mortalities from uh, traffic accidents. And therefore one of the benefits is that we reduce um, traffic mortality from accidents. And in that investment appraisal, the public sector will want to put a monetary value on um, the reduction in traffic accident deaths. And it, to do so, it will have to have some notion of the, prob the lowering in the probability of death and also some notion of the, how much in monetary terms they ought to value a statistical life or that mortality change. Um, now, it's difficult to know with this pandemic exactly what the change in mortality is as affected by the lockdown, because, of course, as I said, we don't really know the underlying case fatality rate, the true fatality rate, but we can make some estimates of this. We can think about um, some of these cruise ship, ships which were affected very early on in the pandemic, which were put into lockdown and isolation as a cruise ship. And we can think of those as kind of natural little experiments. So um, the Diana Princess cruise ship, um, which had 3,711 passengers and crew, was very badly affected by this infection. There were about 705 individuals affected, of whom eight of those individuals who were affected tested positive for COVID-19 died. So from that natural experiment, we have approximately a 20% severe infection rate from COVID and a case fatality rate of about 1.13%. And we also know that the lockdown was quite severe on the Diana Princess because um, the after five days after the, infect, after the first infection, all passengers were confined to the cabins for two weeks or more. And it had a very high infection rate, they think around about uh, one to seven. So the R0 was seven in this, in this particular case. We also know that of countries who have carried out over 10,000 tests by the middle of April or the end of April, the average case fatality rate was about 4%. But again, because we don't really know the denominator is a true denominator there, that's a guess as much as anything. So let's say that from this uh, experiment, we can say or assume that the case fatality rate is approximately 1% to 2% and apply that to the populations of the US and the UK. If the, we look at the US on the left-hand side of the, the slide, populations 320 odd million. If we take the 20% infection rate from that natural experiment on uh, the Diana Princess, we get uh, an infected population of a, just over 65 million. If 1% of these people die, we have about just over 600,000 uh, individuals dying if the infection ran its course within the United States. And the monetary value of these 600,000 uh, odd people uh, can be estimated by the values that the US public authorities put on uh, uh, life. And currently they range between 9.6 million and 10 million. So the statistical value for life in these project appraisals within the US are running at about 10 million. So we have a, a, approximately 656,000 um, uh, uh, individuals who are dying if the pandemic had run its course, valued at 10 million per uh, uh, individual life lost. So with the, without a lockdown, we can say that the value of life's uh, loss is about 6.56 trillion or 6.3 trillion if we use this uh, lower number of the value of life of 9.6 and using a 1% case fatality rate taken from our natural experiment of this cruise ship. If the case fatality rate is higher, if it goes up to 2%, then the value of life's lost is um, around about 13 trillion. So of course, um, 
we've had lockdown and we've had deaths, so we might want to net the deaths out that we've seen with even with the lockdown in the USA. And the USA has seen, as of yesterday, about 115,000 deaths from COVID. So we net those out, apply the same uh, estimate through our calculation, and we say that the monetary value of lives, which has been saved by the lockdown, is about 5.41 trillion at the 1% case fatality rate, or 11.9, almost 12 trillion at the 2% uh, fatality rate. If we apply the same type of calculation to the UK, about 66 million individuals, 20% infected, gives us about 13%, uh, 13 million, 1% die. So we have about 133,000 uh, 100, uh, individuals who are dying. The monetary value used by uh, in public appraisals in the UK is much lower at 1.8 million. And in fact, has been disputed recently by some individuals who are working in the area of public appraisal who say it should be about 8.5 million for each uh, valuation of each life lost. So if we apply those figures to this uh, uh, volume of individuals who would have died without the lockdown, we see that the monetary value of the lives um, lost is about 0.24 trillion if we use um, the lower value of 1.8 million or 1.15 trillion if we use the higher value of about 8.5 million and a 1% case fatality rate. That rises to 2.29 trillion pounds if we use the higher volume of life estimate of 8.5 million and a 2% value uh, on the case fatality rate. Again, if we net out the deaths which have occurred from COVID, even after the lockdown, we see that the monetary value of life saved is about 1.6 trillion pounds at the 1% case fatality rate and the lower value of life estimate, or about 2.29 uh, trillion pounds using a 2% case fatality rate uh, and uh, the 8.59 uh, million pounds valuation of a life. Now, against that, so we've got some figures which tell us about the savings uh, associated with saving lives because of the imposition of the lockdown. Against that, we might say, well, what's the economic cost, the direct cost of the lockdown? And in the United States, the United States has put that at about uh, an annual cost of $3.9 trillion. From our earlier calculation, we had uh, value of life saved at about $5.4 uh, trillion. So the lockdown is, in monetary terms, pure monetary terms, in our public investment sense, been worth it. Within the UK, the Office of Budget Responsibility puts the annual fall uh, attributable to COVID of GDP at about 13%, which gives us a fall of about 0.29 trillion pounds uh, attributable to COVID. And if we use the lower case fatality rate and the lower value of life estimate of 1.8 uh, million, we find that the values of life saved in uh, implementing the lockdown is only 0.16 trillion, below the 0.29 trillion uh, direct costs attributable to GDP fall from COVID. But if we use uh, more representative figures, I'd argue, and uh, higher uh, uh, case fatality rate, we can see that even in the UK, the uh, value of life saves attributable to the lockdown jump up and go well beyond the economic loss uh, attributable to COVID. Um, now that's quite interesting in and of itself, but I suppose what's even as interesting is that we are in a, a massive uh, downturn within our GDP. Uh, here we have a mapping of the percentage annual GDP change uh, since 1908 right through to 2020. And you can see the earlier influenza pandemic um, impact on GDP, the UK GDP, but the largest fall of the century really has been attributable to COVID, this 13% uh, downturn in our GDP. Um, in fact, if we look across uh, all of the countries globally, the OECD uh, wealthier countries have said that if we have uh, just um, a, a initial single hit of COVID, um, we'll be on this trajectory. 
Um, if we have a double hit of COVID, so we have a second wave of the pandemic later on in the year, we'll be on this trajectory. And um, whichever we choose, one hit trajectory or a double hit trajectory with a second wave later in the year. And I suppose the worrying thing about that is the figures from China yesterday, which showed that there's maybe a double um, uh, a double hit to Beijing province um, from COVID. So they're not clear as a country out of the pandemic yet. But regardless of whether we have, as the wealthy countries in the world, a single or a double hit, we don't get back to our 2019 last quarter GDP level for at least two years. So even in the best case scenario, the GDP is not going to recover for at least two years. Now, of course, the longer that GDP takes to recover, the larger is the cost of the lockdown because the cost on the GDP falls as attributable to COVID get larger. And the question arises, is it fair to attribute all of this to COVID? Well, I don't think so. And I, the reason I don't think so is that um, we're living in interesting times. We've essentially had one catastrophe after another. Um, so we had an initial banking catastrophe, if you remember that, uh, in 2008-9. Um, and now we've had a second catastrophe associated with COVID, both of which have affected our GDP growth rates. So global economies were already fragile when the COVID uh, pandemic struck. And in that sense, we've had a sort of interdependency of uh, catastrophes one on top of another. The graphs show um, that, in fact, all of these catastrophes have been against a backdrop of uh, growing debt within countries globally in the top graph. So here we've got debt as a percentage of GDP, total debt in blue, um, the government debt in red, and the private sector debt in yellow. And we've seen uh, debt levels growing over a 40, almost 50 year period now. Um, and in the high income countries, percentage of uh, GDP debt, total debt has now reached uh, almost uh, 280% of uh, uh, the total GDP of the wealthier countries in the OECD. And it's um, debt which is split rather uh, equally across the private and the public sector. Now that's quite import important because if you're in the private sector, you're having, you've got a business, you're holding some debt, there's a massive shock to your aggregate demand, then obviously bankruptcies become important. If you're in the public sector, uh, you may try to help these, the private sector out of that uh, dilemma by increasing public debt because you can't increase taxes so fast, so you borrow more, and uh, the public debt goes up as a result. And in fact, that's... Um, this graph shows exactly that. The levels of uh, gross government debt as a percentage of D GDP in the forecast uh, following the COVID crisis is that um, we'll see debt levels going up to about 120% uh, in the public sector, 120% of GDP, right? So we're going to be at levels of debt above our annual GDP. Rich countries might try to just print money, quantitative easing, as they have been doing to get out of that. Uh, the Federal Bank, for example, yesterday announced that the uh, USA is going to start purchasing private sector debt, partly through uh, uh, printing more money. Um, of course, that may or may not affect us. In the 2008 crisis, that was exactly the policy response of the US and they uh, tripled the monetary base, base between 2008 and 2011. And interestingly, that had no effect on prices whatsoever. And that kind of indicates that we're maybe in a bit of a global liquidity trap that no matter what policy is enacted, it's very difficult to get aggregate demand to shift. Um, we could try to finance this, um, this debt, of course, through increasing our tax base, increasing wealth tax, green taxes, or indirect taxes on consumption. But of course, it may not be enough to uh, offset the growth in debt. And all of this comes at a time when we've already had one catastrophe, remember. So this graph here shows uh, average weekly earnings in real terms, so adjusted for inflation from 2007 to, 
uh, through to 218, just before COVID struck. And the interesting thing here is that real wages fell after the, the financial crisis and were beginning to recover, but just recovered to the uh, 2008 uh, to nine level by last year. So we're in a, a fragile economy for in the UK, uh, at least. And actually, this is true of Europe and the United States. They've had a bit more recovery in terms of the real wage growth um, a bit earlier than the UK. But the UK uh, is fairly representative of the fact that our real wages in our economy have not really recovered to the last catastrophes level. Productivity has been low in all these countries. We've seen low levels of GDP growth generally, high levels of income inequalities, and uh, we've not seen uh, taxes increase enough to offset the debt, even with periods of uh, high levels of austerity within the UK, for example. Um, so I think generally COVID is going to add to this liquidity trap pressure and debt deflationary pressure. So I think I'm fairly pessimistic in terms of what's going to happen uh, to GDP. I don't think there's going to be a quick recovery even over a two year um, cycle. I think it's going to be a much longer term hit on the economy. But uh, I am optimistic as a person, so I like to end with some optimism. I think that um, uh, if we try to uh, dig ourselves out of this uh, this recessionary aggregate demand fall led uh, recessionary pressure. Hopefully it will make uh, economies move towards a greater fiscal stimulus. And we've already se seen that Germany, for example, has uh, just um, changed its views on um, quantitative easing, for example, to try to help the recession in southern Italy and uh, southern Europe, Italy and Spain in particular. So hopefully we'll see more financial stimulus through investment, a move away from consumption to investment is what I, I'd hope would happen. More international cooperation as stimulated by this pandemic uh, and possibly um, more labor market reforms where we move away from less gigging economy type structures to more participation for workers within, um, within their employment. Um, I'd also hope for greater investment in health and social care, um, possibly the creation of new public insurance funds through something like a pandemic bond. Uh, the World Bank already initiated a, a pandemic emergency financing facility in 2017 to help developing countries if a pandemic came through. It's a very small amount of money, but at least they had the structures in place. And then I'd also hope that this will um, recalibrate our incentives towards vaccine research. Vaccine research is, uh, pro vaccines are probably under research for the obvious reason that if you can't very easily predict when a pandemic is going to occur or an epidemic is going to occur, the incentives for R&D into vaccine production are very low. So if you can't predict when the vaccine is going to be used, you're not going to invest up front. The incentive to invest up front is very low. So I'd hope that we'll see um, maybe a, a movement towards governments trying to help R&D be stimulated in the area of vaccines. For example, Germany, again, has just uh, announced yesterday or the day before that it was going to buy into some of the um, shares of a German vaccine company. We might also see some pre-commitment devices whereby governments put money up front in terms of um, uh, commitment to purchase vaccines, even if a, a, a pandemic doesn't arise or an epidemic doesn't arise. So longer term, I, I find it hard to dampen my optimism, but I think we're in a pretty bad immediate state. I think the immediate, the short term responses to the immediate crisis have been very measured and I certainly support the lockdowns. I think even on a very crude uh, modeling by uh, economists of the costs and benefits, I think the lockdowns can be supported. However, I think there are massive interdependencies uh, building off a long-term debt crisis, the 2008-09 financial crisis, and uh, the COVID crisis now coming along. And for the UK in particular, let's not forget about Brexit, probably the best case scenarios for uh, 
um, getting out of Europe are a 5% hit on our GDP as well. So all of these interdependencies are still being worked through. So I'm not very optimistic about the short term, but I think um, we're going to see hopefully some change in social contract over the longer term. Hopefully uh, we'll see this as a dampening down of the populist wave and maybe some more support for experts in the future. Um, and obviously, as you probably have guessed, populism, populism and protectionism in particular, protectionism of your own economy will exacerbate the falls in aggregate demand globally and lead to even worse outcomes with regards to GDP. So that's the situation we're in. Thomas Carlyle once said of economists, there are people who like to make you dismal um, so I hope I haven't done that, but uh, I think we are in a fairly pessimistic um, uh, outlook for the immediate term. With that, um, I would uh, now like to um, uh, hand over to Claire, um, if I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, and. I'll now hand over to Claire to put some um, historical background and perspective onto this with um, hopefully um, uh, some take on the gender issues as well. So over to you, Claire. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I'm not an economist, so maybe I can bring some less dismal comments, although I'm not sure they are going to be any much less dismal. So what I wanted to talk about today was to think about how the response of the coronavirus uh, fits within broader UK policy towards infectious disease outbreaks historically. Now, the UK has been a real pioneer of responding to global health emergencies and indeed creating this whole subset of, of um, policy around global health security. And this started in the UK um, with the publication of the Health is Global Strategy. This is the second one you've got on your screen, but it started in 2008. And this was within the uh, New Labour uh, government of Brown, and it was part of a kind of continuation of the Blairite logic of international interventionism. And it was about how can you use international activity to protect UK shores? And this was extended to global health security. So one of the key paragraphs within this framework was that um, one of the key things we can do to protect the health of the UK proactively is by tackling health challenges which begin outside our borders. And this has been the kind of key mantra of all UK policy towards, UK, towards um, global health security in the last couple of decades. And this is really important and this document is really important for a number of reasons. First of all, it was one of the first policy uh, policy pieces that we saw globally, which really put global health security and this this notion of we've got to protect our, you know, we've got to ensure there is capacity globally to respond to outbreaks as part of this nationalist doctrine. And indeed, this health is global strategy was a blueprint for many other um, governments who have subsequently developed uh, global health strategies. So it was really quite pivotal. Now it's not without. Um, not without critique. So this health is global strategy was uh, criticized for being uh, very self-interested in that we need to improve capacity of health elsewhere in the world solely to protect UK economic and security interests. And also that uh, part of this strategy involved how can we export UK expertise in this area? How can we export the NHS model? How can we export uh, kind of how well the UK is doing in controlling for infectious disease? And how can we you know, use that as a commodity as a fundraising mechanism. So this policy, I just wanted to add that because it's not without critique, but it has been the kind of framework that we can use to think about how the UK responds to infectious disease outbreaks. And this external internationalist approach to thinking about global health, we see across UK policy in disease control. So the UK, if the US withdraws from the WHO, will be the top state donor to the World Health Organization. And this is the most up-to-date budget we had, but in 2018, again, you can see that the UK is the largest funder to the core contributions for the WHO. So that's the, the money that the, WH, the World Health Assembly has control of as opposed to voluntary contributions. But it is a major donor across the board, demonstrating how it sees itself as 
uh, a leader in global health policy, but also how it recognizes the value of multilateralism and the role of the World Health Organization. And in particular, we see this more recently with the, um, with the UK government's um, faith and, and uh, support to the health emergencies program. Now, we haven't just seen this activity globally through supporting WHO, but we've seen it through Public Health England activities. So, for example, they have done through the Health is Global strategy, they have also been doing a lot of capacity building and supporting governments in lower middle income countries to build surveillance capacities, laboratory capacities, um, uh, contact tracing capability, human resource capability because they think that this is the kind of stalwart to be able to detect diseases and importantly, to respond to them at the location, at the source. The idea is that if you can get to an outbreak before it becomes a major epidemic, then it's gonna be a lot more costly to manage. And so the UK government has really supported working at the source in this area. Now we can see this in empirical examples, such as during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the UK government did a whole range of things. First of all, they send epidemiological teams to support, um, in particular, the Sierra Leonean uh, response from the Ministry of, of uh, Health there. We saw the deployment of the military, like this picture here. The UK military was deployed to uh, support the response effort in Sierra Leone uh, and to work alongside the Sierra Leonean military and the Sierra Leonean Ministry of Health to uh, mainly perform a command and control structure to build field hospitals to ensure um, quarantines were kept and ensure social isolation and social distancing was maintained. The UK government also sent a number of NHS volunteers to provide on the ground support to health facilities in uh, the Ebola outbreak and also did a lot around uh, investing in vaccine development through a number of, of UK universities and institutions to make sure and, and actually you know one of the um, uh, Ebola vaccines that we now have is, is a product of, of UK investment. And so we can see that they are publicly committed to respond to outbreaks. We've seen that subsequently uh, in their work. These are just some, some tweets that I took uh, yesterday um, of their work that they've, the UK government has done in other outbreaks. So the uh, UK DFID, which now no longer exists as of this afternoon, um, has actively supported the Ebola response. It, it, we sent millions of pounds in the response efforts. Similarly, the UK government has been active in funding immunization programs for polio in Pakistan and in Syria. And so we're seeing that they are you know, actively demonstrating financial and political capital to respond to this outbreak, which is really you know, to, to all different outbreaks and all different areas of health security policy. And this really has positioned the UK government as a leader in global health security and as a leader in kind of responding to emergency uh, emergency outbreaks. So much so that last year, the uh, Global Health Security Index, which was a, a measurement tool designed to, designed to uh, work out how much capacity governments have and how able governments are to respond to outbreaks, suggested that the UK government was the second most um, ready country to respond to an outbreak. Follow, following, uh, followed only, or rather following the US, which was going to be the most ready to deal with an outbreak. Now, this seems at odds with the statistics that Ali's just shown us and, and some of the statistics that I've got on my screen, which were yesterday's um, confirmed cases by the ONS, not the data that we're seeing, which shows these to be underreported um, and, and not accounting for the uh, non-corona related disease uh, deaths. But it's showing that there's a complete mismatch here between what the UK government claims to be a global health, a leader in global health emergencies and the reality that they actually can respond to outbreaks on their own. So the question is, why is it that the UK government, who is such a leader in managing outbreak response um, and pandemic preparedness globally, isn't able to do it on its own shores? And I suggest there's a couple of reasons for this. So. Maybe it's British exceptionalism. We've seen a lot of rhetoric coming out of the Johnson government saying that, you know, we're, we're England, we're Britain, we can do this, we've got all this, you know, ability and world leading experts and world leading this, that and the other. And maybe that concept of British exceptionalism put us in a position where it was never going to happen to us, which we can now see clearly was misguided. 
maybe it's a question of complacency. Uh, so the last major outbreak we had in the UK was foot and mouth disease in 2001. Now that was 20 years ago. Maybe simply governments have stopped investing in pandemic preparedness, in capacity building, in maintaining controls because they don't think it's going to be an issue here. They become complacent about the UK not being the place that's going to have the outbreak. And that also fits in with the broader policy about outbreaks or something that happen elsewhere that we have to protect UK shores from. Maybe it's decades of austerity by conservative governments, which has included the most prolonged uh, NHS funding squeeze. We've seen you know, reduction in ICU beds, for example. We've seen cuts in public health investment across the UK, in particularly around things such as prevention for smoking and alcohol support, and even around obesity um, public health campaigns. And indeed, those factors are now seen to be um, comorbidity or, or, or potential risk factors for the coronavirus outbreak. And so maybe we're seeing these numbers because of hollowing out of the public health infrastructure within the UK. Or maybe it's politics. And maybe it's simply that we have the wrong government with the wrong mandate and the wrong priorities at the time of national crisis. Importantly, uh, we had, uh, for those of you I'm sure you're aware of it, Operation Cygnus, which was our pandemic run through in 2016, which identified a whole number of, uh, of, of gaps in pandemic preparedness that the UK had around uh, provision of PPE, around availability of ventilators. And that wasn't implemented. The, the recommendations that came out of this dry run for a pandemic weren't implemented. And the assumption is they weren't implemented because all money was being diverted to uh, no deal Brexit preparedness and planning, and that this wasn't deemed to be a priority area. And so I think it's really important when we have these discussions, we don't think about the, the background of the political decisions that have gone in at every single level of making decisions around how to respond to this outbreak. It's not just about how has the Johnson government responded in the last six months or four months, however many months we've been in this crisis for. It's about what have the, the successive governments done in the last 20 years or 10 years, uh, which really contextualizes where we are now and shows this sense of, of, of tension between this global leader of the UK internationally in, in outbreak response, and yet an inability to cope with pandemics in our own backyard. And I'm going to leave that there. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, Claire. Um, we'll now pass straight over to Mick Dan. Thanks, Andy. Is that coming up on the screen? Not for me yet, no. worked earlier so strange it's not working now have you yeah that's it now okay thanks yeah thanks so i'm going to talk about covid race and racism and i'm going to take a uk perspective so there's lots of interesting things to say from uh, all sorts of different perspectives but i'm, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a uk uh, overview on what's been going on and this has been a an area of particular interest uh, in the uk and, uh, and I'm just going to leave this with you for a second, that race is not biological. And I think everybody knows this, and, and, and it's kind of obvious, and, and science has moved uh, very clearly to accept this, but when we read studies on COVID, and when people research COVID, they seem to have forgotten this to a large extent. So it's important to think about why and, and, and what's happened. And, and if race is not biological, what is race? And I think to understand what race is in, in a British context, you have to take a historical view. It, it just doesn't make sense uh, any other way. And, and you'd have seen in the UK, we bandy about this term called BAME, which is a really bizarre mixture of ethnicity, of, of skin color, black, uh, geography, Asian, and minority ethnic, which is some kind of a catch-all term. So, but what can we make of this term? Well, actually, if you think about 
who are BAME people? BAME people are people who are in the UK essentially because of the UK's history of colonialism and the UK's history of slavery. That's why BAME people are, are here in the UK. That's the relationship between the UK and this weird phrase BAME. And, and you can see straight away when you look at it like that, that the relationship between BAME people and, and white British people is predicated on a history of racial hierarchy. And so as soon as you take a historical view of who are these people, uh, what is the problem we're talking about? And, and you recognize that there's no such thing as being biologically BAME. This is, is a very weird, strange uh, social construct. Um, it starts to slowly make sense. So, so let's just have a quick look at what the data says so far. Okay, and so, so what does the data tell us? The data tells us that black women are more than four times as likely to die from COVID as white women. This is data from the ONS adjusted by age. Uh, black men are more than four times as likely to die from COVID as, as white men. Uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi women are three and a half times as likely to die as, as white women. Uh, men, similarly for Pakistani and Bangladeshi. So we can see this, these are huge disparities. These are like, uh, you know, if you had a room of uh, 100 black people and 100 white people, for every one white person that died of COVID, four black people would die in that room. I mean, that's uh, bizarre, right? And, and, and then you have to ask, why? Why is this going on? And so there's been a lot of research interest in, in this question of what is it that's causing all of these excess deaths? Right? Uh, so let's turn to that. And, and, and how have people looked at this question? And, and COVID is, is really interesting because we don't have any science on COVID. We, we have no idea what it is, what it does, what affects it. We, we're starting from zero. So the only thing we have to guide our research uh, are our assumptions, are our gut feelings. And, and this is where I think your view of the history becomes important because that, that interpretation of, of uh, who these people are in, uh, frames how you decide to research this question, right? And, and, you know, and, and this is it, you know, that if you think that colonialism and slavery were morally justified because of some kind of an innate superiority or racial or cultural hierarchy, then uh, you're going to look at these questions in a particular way. And, and if you think that they weren't, then you're going to look at these questions in, in a different way. And, and so, so let's look at uh, the two sides. Uh, you know, many people believe that BAME people are innately biologically inferior or culturally deficient. And that might sound like a, a bizarre statement on the face of it, but let's, let's look at some evidence, right? So here's something that our prime minister, uh, Boris Johnson wrote in The Spectator when talking about Africa. He says, the continent may be a blot, but it's not a blot upon our conscience. The problem is not that we, are, we were once in charge, but the, that we are not in charge anymore. That's Boris Johnson, our prime minister. So, so let's not look at these, these quotes as uh, crazy individuals, but, but let's think that we as a society have put this person in power to, to lead us, right? Uh, here is a quote from Melanie Phillips. Melanie Phillips is a panelist on the Moral Maze on the BBC. The BBC is a national broadcaster. So she's, you can see, think of her as a moral voice of the UK. So what does she say? She says, yet having been inculcated with the unchallengeable belief that they are victims of white society, black people believe that any disadvantages they may suffer is not the result of bad luck, circumstances beyond anyone's control, or perish the thought, their own behavior, but must be the product of white racism. I mean, she's, she just uh, can't believe that there's anything apart from their own behavior that could have been causing this, right? Here's another quote from uh, David Green, a director of Civitas, a, a big think tank. Uh, and he starts, as it happens, you know, this is just by chance that uh, ethnic minorities have, have more uh, comorbidities. And, and he says, these differences have no connection to discrimination, right? Uh, and then he goes on to say, there are cultural differences. South Asians are more likely to live in large households comprising three generations these are lifestyle choices unrelated to discrimination. People want to live in overcrowded housing because they're lifestyle choices, right? So this is a view uh, taken by uh, him. Here's our equalities minister. This is a minister in charge of uh, 
taking forward the findings of, of the current debate around uh, why are too many black people dying in this country. Uh, she, she says, let us not in this house, this is her statement in parliament, use statements like being black is a death sentence, which young people out there here don't understand the context and then continue to believe that they live in a society that is against them. When actually, this is one of the best countries in the world to be a black person, right? Uh, this week, uh, the Prime Minister announced a race inequality commission to take this investigation even further. And, and it's telling who he put in charge of that commission. He put in charge uh, a woman called Munira Mirza, who has consistently been uh, on the record of saying that there is no such thing as structural racism. There is no such thing as uh, racial discrimination. So, so these, it's, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. And, and you can see where these people are coming from. They're coming from a perspective that uh, the problem lies in the black and brown bodies and in their behavior, right? So, so this is an interesting way of framing it. Uh, and the per pervasiveness of these be beliefs have resulted in many researchers running models where they adjust out things like social determinants of health. You know, they put these models in and they say, imagine if all black people were professors at universities that lived in mansions that, and, and then what would the difference, but, but they're missing the whole point because the social determinants of health are shaped by structural racism. And instead, so they run these models and then essentially when you look at the model carefully, you find that what they're looking for is innate biological or cultural inferiority of non-white races. When they're running these complex regressions, they put everything into them and then you think, why are these things in there? What are you saying by running such a model, right? And then there's, there's been the, the kind of other side of the debate where people have said that um, uh, they've, they've viewed these racial hierarchies underpinning British society as unjustified and, and they've instead focused on these structural racism and, and the discrimination as causes of COVID. And, and so here's some examples of that side. And, and everybody I, I quote here are, are very much establishment figures, right? This is not about radical fringe voices. So this is Sir Michael Marmot, who's uh, an epidemiologist at uh, UCL. So he said, structural racism abounds in the UK. We need, starting now, to address structural racism and the deep-seated inequalities that cause inequalities in health. Right? So a very different view of where this is coming from. Here's the English historian uh, William Dalrymple. Uh, so this is what he says, and, and this is again a very establishment figure, Oxbridge educated, uh, you know, lives in India now, and, and uh, so he says, we also need to know how far the British, every bit as much as the Germans, helped codify a system of scientific racism, creating a hierarchy of race that put white Caucasians at the top, and blacks, wandering Jews, and Indian Muslims at the bottom. Yet while the Germans have faced up to the darkest periods of their past and are taught about it unvarnished in their schools, we have not even made a start to this process, right? And in even Sir Simon Stevens, the, the chief executive of the NHS, when he was comparing, uh, he, he was thinking about Black Lives Matter and, and he was talking about the, the murder of George Floyd. And he made the connection between the murder of George Floyd and COVID-19. And, and he says it's wrong to marginalize this moment by trying to compartmentalize it as racism over there in America and not here in Britain, or racism as part of our history from slavery to the Windrush, but not lived, not our lived present. That would be to misunderstand and obscure important truths about fairness and equality in modern Britain. Right? So, so there's two very different sides of the debate, depending on whether you see uh, brown and black bodies as innately, uh, biologically or culturally inferior, or you see the problem rather in society and how they treat, how society is treating uh, these bodies, right? And so researchers who have held these views, and, and there are much less of them, uh, have explored racially patterned inequalities in the social determinants of health and their impacts and the likelihood of, of catching COVID, the likelihoods of having a severe case of COVID and the likelihoods of having adequate care in hospital once you go in uh, and get COVID. And just a, a very simple, I mean, I could have done a whole presentation on this and, and I have actually, if you follow this link when I share the slides, you'll see all sorts of details on this, but this is just a simple 
a description of uh, where people live in the UK. So you can see the yellow bars are the white population. And you start with the richest areas on the left-hand side and the poorest areas on the right-hand side. And the, the blue bars are the non-white population. So you can see that the white population is almost equally distributed across the country. Whereas uh, the blue bars, the non-white population is massively skewed towards the poorest parts of the country. And you can see this in, in all sorts of other things in terms of occupations, in terms of housing density, in terms of air pollution, in terms of you name it, uh, society is, is patterned in these ways. And, and so, so my first thought was maybe we need to just investigate all of these different ways and really figure out and, and make the case for um, structural racism or uh, some kind of social inequalities being the answer. And then I started thinking about, well, what is the way forward? And, and, and I turned to two quotes that, that I really like from Toni Morrison. Right? And, and the first one is, is this, she says, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. And, and this, as, a, as an economist, this is obvious, right? Uh, it keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again, your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly. So you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. There's always one more thing. There's always a vitamin D or a something else that people will come up with that's unprovable science, right? And then she turns to, so what's the solution? What's the solution? Well, what's, what's the real problem here? If the real problem is racism, the real solution isn't trying to find the problem in the black and brown bodies. The real solution is in trying to fix the racism, right? So she says, if you can only be tall because somebody is on their knees, then you have a very serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it, right? So interventions to address structural racism and discrimination are crucial if we are to stem this, the cries of I can't breathe, both on our streets and in our hospitals. Our willingness to pursue these will indicate whether or not as a society, we genuinely believe that Black Lives Matter. Thanks, Big Dad. Uh, we'll turn now to the last presentation by Jose Luis Fernandez. Thank you very much, Ali. So I'm going to just start my presentation. Can you see that? Yes. So the aim of the presentation um, is really to look at uh, the challenges that the COVID-19 epidemic has uh, posed and is posing, and might pose in, again, <laughs> Uh, to the social care system. Uh, for those of you that are not UK based, in, in the UK we use the term social care to refer to the care and support that people with health, let's say mental or physical um, health problems receive, which is not, uh, does not include a medical component. So for example, help with your daily activities, your personal care, your feeding, etc. So um, what I would like is to discuss um, why it is that uh, COVID-19 is particularly challenging in terms of the social care system and the people for people with social care needs um, and give some evidence of the extent to which um, the social care system is being impacted in the UK, but also uh, internationally. Um, highlight some of the things that we know, but also some of the things that we'll need to find out soon in order to understand the long-term consequences of the epidemic, and then think about some of these uh, those long-term implications. Um, uh, in terms of the evidence I'm going to use, and I've only got um, a few minutes, uh, so uh, I strongly recommend you that you go to uh, an international repository of evidence that we've set up called LTC COVID, if you're interested in understanding the impact of COVID-19 on the social care system. Uh, there's um, a very large repository of evidence. Of course, evidence is a, is a complicated term to talk uh, to use when in the context of COVID, because obviously um, there hasn't been a, a whole uh, load of, um, you know, uh, 
evaluations, etc. So evidence is emerging as we speak, as it were. But there is a lot of uh, information in that uh, website uh, which uh, describes what different countries have done and the extent to which their systems have been affected. Um, and by the way, just um, acknowledge colleagues uh, from the uh, um, Care Policy and Evaluation Center, Adelina Comas Herrera in particular, who leads that um, area of work. The other um, area of evidence that I'm going to be using and mostly uh, relates to a partnership that we set up with the um, all social care departments in the Greater London area. Again, in particular for those um, international um, uh, attendees, uh, the uh, Greater London area uh, includes around 9 million people and 32 boroughs. And so what we've been doing is working with, with all of those to collect information on a daily basis about the uh, impact on the care system in, in the grand, uh, great, Greater London area. Um, and there again, I just want to uh, quickly acknowledge my, my colleagues, uh, Javier uh, Cartagena Farias, um, Francesco D'Amico, Amrit Pal Rehill, uh, Sam Rickman, uh, Kevin Wren, Wen Bosong, and Juliette Mali, who've contributed to this work. So, why is it that COVID 19 is particularly relevant in, when we think about the social care system? On the one hand, we're talking about uh, people with social care needs that almost by definition are going to be at a greater risk from COVID 19. Uh, the bulk of social care users are older people, and we know that uh, age is a, a very significant uh, risk factor in terms of risk of mortality and uh, comorbidities from uh, COVID-19. But not just that, um, they are typically uh, going to be characterized by uh, significant um, comorbidities, which are, again, risk factors of uh, poor outcomes in terms of uh, COVID-19. For example, even uh, younger clients, uh, younger uh, people that uh, receive social care, people, for example, with learned disabilities, they often will have diabetes, um, uh, coronary heart disease, etc. Again, risk factors which place them at particular risk. But it's not just their uh, characteristics, it's also the fact that uh, in terms of some of the, the recipes for dealing with uh, COVID, so some of the measures that are taken in order to protect ourselves against COVID, well, those are particularly difficult to implement for at least some of those people with social care needs. So you're thinking about, for example, social distancing, maintaining social distancing with somebody who's got dementia, for example, or who's got uh, learning difficulties and behavioral problems, that's gonna be particularly challenging. And so it's not just that there are sort of risks, is also the fact that uh, some of the solutions are more difficult to implement for them. And of course, many people with social care needs are living in communal environments where, again, issues of, um, of social distancing, for example, are particularly difficult because many of those places were not designed for uh, preventing communicable uh, diseases. Um, and then finally, one that is um, as, um, Ali alluded um, earlier, which is this, the, the fact that the social care system is not you know, a system that works in isolation is a system that is, is linked to, in particular, the um, healthcare system and is often seen, used, I don't know what the term is, um, as a way of relieving pressure on other parts of the health and, and care system. And in particular, uh, one of the concerns that all governments have had during the uh, pandemic has been to make sure that the capacity in the uh, intensive care units was protected and therefore that required people being discharged as soon as possible. And often those people then need to be discharged to, um, to the social care system and in particular to care homes. And that has posed significant problems. So those are sort of the, the reasons why uh, we should always have expected the social care system to be at particular uh, risk from the pandemic. And of course, what we're seeing is a much higher prevalence of symptoms among social care uh, recipients, much higher pro uh, mortality, and I'll show you some uh, statistics in a second, uh, but also, you know, impact on quality of care and well-being and not just mortality. Impact on the workforce. Uh, again, I'll, I'll present some uh, brief data in a second. And uh, then th there are questions about the long term sustainability, financial sustainability of, of, the, uh, of the supply of uh, social care, so the social care system. So in terms of mortality, and I'm not going to, you know, there's, uh, if you want to see um, more data on this, I strongly suggest that you go to ltccovid.org and you'll find all the details. All I wanted was to show that uh, one slide in terms of that, which shows um, two things. One, the numbers of uh, death, uh, deaths uh, related to COVID, and there are many, many uh, technical issues about the comparability of uh, mortality across countries. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, there is a, a monograph that uh, deals 
specifically on, on uh, with those those issues. But basically, you can on the on the very right you've got the U.S. that by this time were approaching 100,000 uh, dead. They're now exceeded, well exceeded that that figure. But the the, the interesting thing is that you know whereas you've got a range of uh, overall mortality figures, in terms of the share of that mortality which has been located in care homes in the social care system and specifically in care homes for older people, that is very significant internationally everywhere. And so uh, you've got, for example, um, in the UK and England in particular, England and Wales, we calculate that around 40 percent of all deaths have happened in care homes. Um, but, all, you know, and that happens um, as well in, in Korea, you know, um, where they've got, I think, 38 percent, uh, something like 38 percent of all deaths uh, have happened in, in care homes. Even if in Korea we're talking about 84 deaths, and in, the, in, in England and Wales, we're talking about uh, 20,000 deaths. So what I'm saying is that no matter where you are and how well the country is doing, the, pre the um, prevalence of mortality in care homes is very significant uh, everywhere. And, uh, the, and, and if you reverse the picture there, you, you could say as well that actually how well the social care system is going to do is going to be uh, significantly um, driven by how well the country does as a whole and the measures that are taken to protect society as a whole. Just uh, one thing I'm going to uh, highlight in terms of the challenges of uh, um, uh, measuring mortality, in particular in care homes, and this is data uh, from the ONS, which is specifically, is, is, is all data is from the 1st of May, but it's interesting because it is specifically looking at, at uh, care homes in, uh, in England and Wales. And you can see how, whereas the uh, deaths that are certified uh, on the basis of death certificates as being related to COVID-19 in care homes, uh, that those are about 10,000, were about 10,000 on the 1st of May. When you actually compare excess mortality, actually that doubles the figure. And so the actual impact on mortality in care homes is going to be much, much bigger than the, the sort of the standard figures that are given on the basis of uh, registry, death registry information. And this is partly because of problems with underreporting of COVID uh, in the uh, death certificates, but also because of issues in terms of knock-on effects on the quality of uh, the care that other people receive. Now, uh, what is interesting in our, is not just these big numbers in terms of uh, mortality, but also to try to understand what are the factors that drive um, you know, the outcomes at the care home level in particular, because care homes have been, in particular, those bits of the system that have been mostly affected. And so here is where I would like to use the um, uh, London data that we've been collecting since the end of um, of March on a daily basis. We've been collecting data from all the care providers across the Greater London um, area. And um, this, this graph shows two things. One is the numbers of people with symptoms, and you can see how the peak, London reached the peak around the first two weeks of April, where we had um, around 1,400 residents, older residents. This is uh, specifically for older people in residential care. And that has been now uh, reducing ever since. And then the other thing that it shows is the mortality, which uh, we changed our indicator of mortality on the 21st of April. And now we measure mortality uh, related to COVID, which is this red, um, related to COVID in hospitals, which is the black, and overall mortality. And this is important. You know, there's uh, care homes are places where people die frequently. And so there's a lot more mortality than COVID mortality in care homes. But what is, you know, this is just the context. What I wanted was to show you how, for example, if you start splitting the care sector between the types of homes, so if you look at nursing care homes, which look after people who are generally more dependent than residential care homes, you see how um, those types of homes have been uh, um, affected very differently. Nursing homes much, much more affected, both in terms of mortality and the numbers of cases. This is in partly reflecting the sort of the greater number of nursing home beds in London, but nevertheless, uh, and in fact, the next uh, slide will show you that if you look at what's happened between the end of March and uh, the present in terms of um, the proportion of the homes that have got at least one of the residents with COVID-19 and you split the population of um, care homes by their size, you can see that, uh, again, the peak was reached at around the beginning of the, um, the first two weeks of April and that's been going down, but you can see how there's a big difference uh, in the prevalence of COVID by the size of the care homes. 
And this is very important because this information is the sort of information you need in order to target support to the care sector. And so um, the small homes have been much, much more effective at protecting themselves and avoiding um, having um, COVID enter their, their home. Um, I don't have uh, lots of time to uh, go into details, but basically what we've done is matched the information about the care homes to um, other information about their characteristics, the prevalence obviously of uh, COVID and mortality, matched against information on other characteristics of the homes and local area. And what we're trying, starting to see, and these are ongoing analyses, is that one thing is that the size of the care home is absolutely crucial in terms of the risk to the care home. Think about playing dice more often if you're having uh, more residents in your home. The type of care home is also very important, but also we're starting to see some effects of um, the quality of the home pre-COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, some indications of local deprivation uh, um, working its way through into the risk at the home level, which is uh, interesting, but you know it's early stages of the analysis. Staff on availability crucially very, very strongly correlated with uh, the, uh, the, the, the presence of COVID. However, there is a, a potential endogeneity here clearly because if you've got uh, a big outbreak in a home, it is likely that the, the staff will either catch COVID or might need to self-isolate. And another thing that is worth uh, pointing out is that those nursing homes, those homes that haven't, have been doing particularly badly, have those that have received the greatest numbers of hospital discharges, and we've got information on that. Just um, that's in terms of uh, the outcomes at the care home level, but also in terms of um, uh, workforce. I haven't got the time to go into any detail, but you can see how, if you focus on the green there, you'll see how the numbers of staff that were unavailable to work shot up at the beginning of the, the pandemic, reached a plateau of 4,000, and then has been going down. Okay, so that's been getting better, but it got to a very uh, uh, serious uh, level of um, unavailability of staff. And what's happened is that those care homes have been uh, taking in agency staff and staff from other places. And that in itself has been a risk factor because you don't know the extent to which those people are at risk or not to the residents. Um, one thing I was going to point out very, very quickly is that the ONS has published uh, uh, figures in terms of mortality for the workforce. And um, the, um, it suggests, it demonstrates that uh, social care workers are a significantly higher uh, level uh, risk of mortality than even healthcare workers. So the, this, the mortality effect is not just for residents, it's also for workers, although overall the risk uh, or mortality of risk is still small for the workforce in care homes. Finally, uh, the one, one of the, the, um, the last few slides I wanted to highlight is, you know, the, there is, of, of course, the, uh, the impact on mortality and on, on quality of life, well-being, etc. There's also something about what's going to happen to the long-term care sector and the supply of uh, care homes uh, in the next two, three years, potentially. And what is very interesting is to see that although um, the, the numbers of uh, people with symptoms have been decreasing and have been decreasing for a, a long time now. And uh, workforce is no longer um, so much of an issue. Um, the actual capacity or the occupancy rates have uh, gone down significantly and then not picking up. Okay, and um, so whereas at the beginning, most homes would be around 90% occupancy levels, those have gone down. For nursing homes, we're talking about an average of about 78%. For large care homes, it's even below that. And that is a big problem because uh, you're losing money every week uh, because your, your revenue uh, is uh, reduced by the voids that you're having to, to carry. And we're doing analysis around the financial sustainability implications of, of that work. One thing I'm going to uh, highlight on that very briefly is that if actually you look at that impact in terms of how much of my revenue am I losing as a result of the staffing changes and as, as a result of my, um, the fact that I've got fewer uh, residents in my homes, the biggest risk is actually faced by the smaller providers. The smaller providers that tend to be the higher quality providers in general. And so whereas the overall biggest losses are concentrated on the big providers, those with uh, more beds, in terms of the risk that's concentrated on the uh, smaller, pro smallest providers. Finally, some conclusions. So I think you know there's very, very clear evidence that the social care sector, not just in the UK, but internationally, has been one of the worst affected areas of the welfare system, um, certainly in terms of mortality, but also in terms of um, the workforce implications. And there is a very 
key question about uh, what's going to happen in the next uh, 12 months, two years. Is demand going to uh, pick up or not again? Are people going to consider residential care homes something that they no longer want to use? Um, and what's going to happen to the, 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 the care providers in the sector? The, uh, there is also very clear evidence now that there is big variability in the outcomes um, of the care system across countries. And, um, and therefore that suggests that it is possible to do better and to do worse. And therefore that there are post policy measures that, that, that can be implemented to address the, the risk to social care from COVID. Although a lot of those policies are not just care specific, they're society wide uh, measures. And then finally, uh, we do need to get better information about a number of things. One is the well being implications. So we know that lots of people with dementia are being detained for, are being having to either um, be stuck in their own uh, rooms or having to be given uh, chemicals in order to uh, you know, drugs in order to um, comply with social distancing. We know that unpaid carers have been doing a lot more work than they used to do, and we don't know what the long term consequences uh, are of that. The, obviously, the mental health implications of for the workforce. And finally, this again, going back to the question of long term demand and financial sustainability. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jose Luis. Um, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. There's been a host of questions. Please do email any of the speakers uh, with your question if I don't get round to it, as I won't do, um, I'm sure. Um, but you can find our email addresses on the Department of Health Policy website. Uh, so please do email us if we don't get round to your question. I'll kind of go in reverse order. Um, uh, Jose Luis, there was a question from Sasha Nauta about um, there seems to be a lack of integration between health and social care, which is worse within the UK than other countries. Do you think there's any particular reason for that? The obvious implication being that that's not helped the COVID um, response. So do you think there's a particularly bad problem in the UK and any particular reason? I think the, the problem of coordination of um, um, between health and social care is a significant problem in this country. I think it's a significant problem in many other countries because of the differences in the um, in the funding arrangements, in the regulatory arrangements, in the professional arrangements. The I, I wouldn't say, and I've been part of many discussions between health and social care partners, in particular in the London area. I wouldn't say that there's been the issue has been a lack of coordination. I think the issue has been. Uh, one of uh, judgments about where the weakest link would be, the uh, issues of understanding what the pressures would be in, on the acute sector and the measures that were taken to protect the acute sector that led to um, perhaps people being placed in care homes um, too early and, and at risk um, without testing. Okay, thank you. Mick Dad, um, there was a question as to um, what's the one thing that you could do as a policy response to change perceptions on discrimination? And um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one one thing that's going to be interesting is this Friday the ONS are going to bring out um, data by religion, so breakdowns by religion. And I think since September the 11th, we've seen this kind of concerted program uh, by the government to inculcate unconscious biases against Muslims into all public institutions. And, and this is a prevent program. So I think if there was one thing that you would do that would really perhaps address some of these things, it would be to abolish that and try and mitigate some of the impacts of, of that so far. Okay, thank you. And Claire, um, uh, if, if there's a question about uh, policy response and uh, the idea that politicians are somehow giving the impression that they're doing the best that we can do. Um, what do you think will change that perception that from of the best that we can do? We're doing the best we can. Is it true we're doing the best we can? Or can you change it if it's not? Well, we're not we're not doing the best we can because if we were doing the best we can we wouldn't have the numbers we've got uh, in terms of incidents and also mortality and uh, also the uh, you know who it's affecting as well right so following on from what Mick Dad's saying uh, the the uh, assumptions that the government made early on have been seen to shown to be wrong the modelers have uh, you know admitted that they made mistakes early on the government still seems to think they are 
um, leading the way. We've got a world leading track and trace system and we've got an amazing response and you can't possibly compare case numbers internationally because of the way of different, you know, different people count and test and all sorts. But, you know, the there are things you could have done. They could have locked down sooner. They could have, uh, you know, why are we so fixated on British exceptionalism that we have to create our own app for track or trace rather than just using a track or tracing app which has been trialed and worked in South Korea or Taiwan, for example. Uh, why are we building these delays that are unnecessary into our system? And I think a little bit of uh, humility and hubris from the government to say, look, we have made mistakes and those mistakes have made lives, but we're going to try and uh, do what we can to mitigate would be, I think, welcome. Uh, and I think particularly when we think about those who are affected and the, uh, I don't want to use the term, but black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups that um, are distinctly being affected. Don't bring out a report from Public Health England identifying the problem of who's being in, uh, affected the most and who's dying the most without bringing out recommendations to support it. And so again, it's, this, it's identifying the problem but without producing policy. And so the government can kind of make these statements that they need to kind of implement uh, those, those statements as well. Thank you. Um, there was a uh, question from Lee Jones asking whether cru cruise ships are useful in modeling because they're probably skewed towards a particular age and comorbidity and fatality rates have been as low as 0.1%. I'd actually argue that cruise ships, given what we now know, are probably more reflective of the susceptible population than many other uh, natural experiments. As I said, please do get back to us through email if you have further questions. I'm sorry I've not been able to get around to all of your questions. Um, it's been a great pleasure to um, have this opportunity to discuss these uh, various presentations with you. Um, thank you very much for taking part as uh, part of the audience and uh, grateful to all the participants that you could find time to um, be with us today. So from all of us at the Department of Health Policy, wish you well and safe and hope to see you again soon. I know that Mick Dad is speaking about his research, other aspects of his research at another of these events on the 1st of July. Um, so I'd um, encourage you all to take part in that or look that event up. Um, otherwise, um, if you want to learn more about the department uh, or our research, please do visit our website uh, within the LSE or follow us on Twitter at uh, LSE Health Policy. And with that, we've got about 30 seconds to run. So thank you all very much. And again, I'd encourage you to ask your questions if I've not got round to you through email. Thank you. Bye.